All right. So guys, this is going to be the second part of the introduction to finance and accounting. So last time what we discussed, and please jump in whenever you guys have any questions. We had spoken about the efficient market hypothesis that like, you know, your belief in how efficient the market is, how quickly information travels through the stock price change uh, and how much information affects the stock price. Um, that's, you know, depending on your worldview of the efficient market hypothesis, that's going to dictate a lot of how you view stocks and stock prices. We spoke about investing styles like value investing, growth investing and momentum investing. We spoke about liquidity. That's the ability to quickly convert any asset into cash. We spoke about long versus short positions, long meaning that you are betting that a stock will go, uh, will increase in value or a company's market cap will increase, whereas shorting is saying that the stock price or the value of a company will go down in, in, the, in the future. Uh, holding periods we spoke about in terms of, you know, either you have a short term horizon or you have a long term horizon or a you know, very long term horizon. So holding period could be anything from a minute if you're a day trader, I mean, a few seconds or milliseconds if you're doing high frequency trading. Or it could be a minute or it could be an hour, day, week, month, year or decade. Um, you know, and Warren Buffett is a really good example of a very long term, long holding period investor. Um, market capitalization we spoke about, which is basically the total, the share price of a company multiplied by the total outstanding shares that have been issued into the market, uh, which means that that's basically the total size of the company. So when you say that, OK, Apple has a market cap of nine hundred and fifty billion dollars. Uh, what does that mean? That means if you, if you divide their share price by their market cap, you'll get the number of shares that have been issued in the market. So if you hold a certain percentage of shares of Apple, suppose you have 100 shares of Apple and there are you know 100 million outstanding shares, you can say the liquidity for that stock will be very high since it's very easy for you to sell 100 shares when there are 100 million out there. But if you had 100 shares and there were only 200 shares in the market, uh, it could be a very illiquid asset because you own 50% of the entire liquidity of the company. Uh, and that could be a very low market cap company because the stock price could be, you know, say $10 times 100 shares. So the whole market price, the whole market cap is just $1,000 for the entire company. And the IC investing cell, that's not relevant for now. So quiz time. Uh, who is the father of value investing? Does anybody remember, know, or want to guess? <coughs> What's your guess, Anjana? Okay, Warren Buffett, what about you, Jasir? Okay, Sandeep, any guesses? Anybody else? Any guesses? Okay. Yeah, so, um, all right. The answer is Benjamin Graham, but why did you guys think that? Sandeep, you need to mute yourself, man. When you're not talking, when you're talking, keep it on. But when you're not talking, please mute yourself. <coughs> well, he wrote a lot of books, uh, but the you know the most in, uh, important one is the Intelligent Investor, and basically he wrote a lot about the theory and the theorems of value investing, about how to split up your portfolio between bonds and between bonds and stocks. And what percentages of you know yield you can expect for a different type of portfolio and portfolio analysis and how to create a basket of stocks that will drive value regardless of where the economy is going. So the Intelligent Investor is a very important book that he wrote that has guided a lot of the investing principles of people like Warren uh, Buffett. So he, the father of value investing is, is considered Benjamin Graham. Any questions about that so far? Okay, so let's go to the next one. All right, here's, a, here's an example. Okay, you shorted Apple at $750 and you covered at $250, assuming $10 in fees. How much do you make on this trade? Make or lose on this trade. So remember that shorting AAPL is the stock ticker of Apple company or like Apple computer and company, right? So <coughs> you're shorting Apple at $750, which means that you are saying that the stock price from $750 is going to go down you're not expecting it to go up because normally when you guys think about stocks, you think about, okay, I'm going to buy it 100, I'm going to sell it 150. But when we're shorting, we're going to buy it 750, we're going to sell it a lower amount. So here we're saying we bought it 750, we sold it at 250. I'll explain a little bit more detail how you can sell something that you don't own, but uh, because you don't own Apple at 750, right? You're, you're covering it 250. So um, what do you think the profit on this trade would have been? Any guesses? Uh, 
Anybody wants to take a shot? There's only three numbers up there, so you can just take a guess. Yeah, okay, it's pretty easy to like, figure it out, uh, you know, if you just use basic math. But yeah, 750 minus 250, that's $500, and minus $10 in fees, which is 490 Right. So now how do we do that? So what we're doing is that we're going to borrow the stock from somebody. And I'm going to tell Josh, so Josh is going to have Apple stock at 750 Okay, I'm going to borrow it from him and say, like, hey, I'm going to borrow this from you. But and then for borrowing, I'm going to pay you ten dollars. Right? It's still your stock. I'm just going to borrow. I'm going to give it back to you at a later date. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that stock and I'm going to sell it in the market, right, at uh, two hundred fifty dollars. But I'm going to sell it back to Jasir at seven hundred and fifty because that's what I borrowed it at. So what I sold into the market for two hundred and fifty when I bought, what I sold, gave it back to Yasir at seven hundred and fifty, right? That five hundred dollars minus the amount that I had to give Yasir, Yasir for the. Um, for the uh, ability to borrow that stock of ten dollars, that's how much commission I paid, and I reached you know total profit of four ninety. Don't worry too much about that. I just wanted to give this example because it gives you know gives you a quick insight into how this kind of works. But don't worry too much about it. Okay. So what is not true of an OTC market? So OTC market, if you remember, is called over the counter, right? It is the secondary market. It's an OTC market. So uh, OTC market is a type of secondary market. So what is, an, what is not true of an OTC market, over-the-counter market? This is, again, like very technical, so you don't have to really worry too much about it. You just want to get used to and familiar with these terminologies so you can do your own research and learn more about what interests you. <coughs> Does anyone remember? Okay, so in an OTC market, um, basically buyers assume all the risk is not true. So the risk is divided between the buyer and the seller. Now, I don't really want to get too much into this. Just remember OTC market is over the counter market where um, the prices are, are spot prices. Like what do you see? Like if, if I go to Sandeep and I'm like, hey, I want to buy Netflix stock. He's like, okay, fine. I have some for $5. Do you want some? Right. That's where the buyer and the seller are together negotiating on the price and selling it there and then. Whereas when you look at a central exchange, right, like NASDAQ or Bombay Stock Exchange, there's a, there's a price that everyone can see and it's listed everywhere, right? So that, that price is, can be Googled. So I can just see Netflix stock price is $150 and I just have to find somebody who's going to sell me it at that particular price. But in OTC over-the-counter market, you have to think of it more like a trade between a buyer and a seller on an agreed-upon price. So we're not going to worry about this. It's a very US-specific. So, I mean, this guy who all knows... This is Mr. Warren Buffett, one of the legendary investors of our time, who has uh, amassed a ton of wealth by investing in companies. Does anybody know who this is? This guy's name is George Soros. Uh, he's, a, again, a very heavy lifting investor, and uh, he's known as the guy who broke the Bank of England. So if you're interested in some financial history, you can Google, um, you know, I think it's probably a Black Wednesday is when George Soros did a trade that was so bad that he almost brought the entire British economy down to its knees. And he made, a, I believe, a billion dollars that day, whereas uh, on a short, on a short position, whereas the uh, Bank of England almost went bankrupt because of his trade. It's a very interesting piece of history. This guy is Bill Ackman. Uh, he is an active investor in the sense that he has a firm called Pershing Square Capital. And what they do is that he will get into a company and actively manage that company to make sure that his company profits uh, and because of his company profits and him as a shareholder will profit. So he'll go into companies that are either uh, not in profitability right now or not doing very well in the last few years. He'll come in, he'll fire everybody in the management team, put it in his own management team, take a very active role on the board of directors and then make sure that that company turns around and uh, generates a lot of profit for him as a, as a shareholder. So it's a very different way of investing is it, as an active investor. Okay, so that's just a little bit stuff to jog your memory and jog your minds. Um, next up, <coughs> this is probably the most important thing you need to know for right now, right? Is that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. Now, who can tell me why that is? Why is a rupee valuable more today than, than a rupee's value tomorrow? Any guesses? 
Yeah, but what does that mean? How how does that? Right. Yeah, exactly. So you're eroding away value of that because of purchasing power of the dollar rupee, right? Because of inflation. So if an apple costs you 100 rupees today, tomorrow it may cost you 105 rupees. So your 100 rupees today can't even get you an apple tomorrow. But today it can get you an apple, right? You can consider it like that. That's another very important point. Anybody else with, the, with that? That's one part of it. What about the other part of it? You can do what you want with your dollar today, right? You can take that dollar and you can invest it into something. So not only are you like tracking inflation, you're also beating the beating inflation. So if, it, if, if the value of money is inflating at say 4% a year, uh, and for example, you're, you're able to generate 10% of per year in returns, Right, that 6% per year is straight profit that you made. So that $1 that you have in your pocket today can be used in multiple ways to generate more financial reward for you than a dollar tomorrow. Is that clear? So two things. One is the purchasing power of the dollar is uh, lower in the future than it is today. You can buy more stuff today than you can tomorrow, the same nominal value. And the second is that you can invest that dollar, that rupee, to earn interest on it, to have more than $1 in the future. And point one, right, is an effect of point two. Because we can invest and because a dollar can be uh, put into a savings account and earn interest, that's why inflation even exists. So it's a very, it's, it's, it's kind of symbiotic, it's in relationship. Inflation, investment, and interest all exist in the, in the same world. Okay, any questions about this? Okay, so a little bit of uh, math now. Let's not let's not focus too much on the math since this is not really a math class. This is more about getting giving you guys an overview. But this is the kind of stuff that I want you to be thinking about. So the point of this SDT, right, in the series of SDT, is for you to get involved in uh, these different types of skills. Right? So different investors use varying types of skills to make investment decisions. Some are very mathematically driven. Some are very fundamentally or news driven. Some are investment thesis driven, and a lot of them are a combination of everything. Right, so somebody may have an idea to buy a stock because of the news or because of some information, but they may use mathematics to figure out when to buy and when to sell. So interest has an impact on the value of an investment, right? If compound interest is used, the growth of an investment is different in different time periods, reflects all previous interest earned, right? What you have to understand is that everything that we are doing is based on a prediction of what's going to happen in the future. If I'm looking at Apple stock price today, it's a it's a prediction of where Apple as a company is going to be in the future. I'm not saying that Apple is worth $700 today of what they did in the past. I'm saying Apple is worth $700 today or because of what they're going to be building in the future. And based on the world view and investor viewpoint of what a company can do is how much the stock price of that company will change. So when an investor for a startup is coming to give some money to the company at a valuation, we know that valuation is not the value of the company today, but it's an implied valuation of what the company can do in the future. Right? So if I'm making $1,000 a month today, my value of the company is technically just $1,000 a month. Right? That's the value that's being generated plus the team, plus the technology. Say it's worth $5,000 a month. <clears throat> but I may get a valuation of $20,000 a month because that using that $5,000 a month valuation and what, what I'm earning right now, I can use that to better propel the company in a better position and in the future they may be making a lot more money than what they're making today. So everything that we do in finance is about a prediction of the future. And so all of those predictions are discounted back into where we are today. So, in a, simple, so a simple question is, uh, if I earn 10% per day on $100, how much would I have tomorrow? Right? So in four days, how much would I have? So in, in, if I invested, so 10% on 100 is how much? In one day. So I am earning 10% per day. I have $100 in my pocket today. How much would I have tomorrow? Anybody? Guys, are you with me? Or what's 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 tripping you up about this question? How many of you guys have taken finance classes? Okay, yeah, it is 110, but but why, why? How did you reach that number, Anjana?
So, so what you did was simple interest. You did not do compound interest. Cause, yeah. Right. So, guys, uh, Yasir and Sandeep, if this is like tripping you up, you have to understand very clearly that 10% on 100 is $10. Right. So, if I take 10 divided by 100 times 100, that's $10. Right? And if I say that's over one day, then tomorrow I'm going to take that $100 that I have plus the 10% of 100, which is 10, and add those together to get 110. Right. Oops. Any doubts about that? This is very extremely basic math. So just let me know if you have any doubts. Right, so 10% per day on 100. Right, so that's uh, 100 plus your interest, which is 10%, right, which is equal to 110. That's day one, right? Now on day two, what happens? Now I'm asking in four days. So in day two, what's going to happen? Now I have 110 in my pocket, right? Plus 10% on what I have in my pocket, which is 110. So 10% of that is how much? Guys, 10% of 110. Right? 11, right? I'm going to take that interest and then I'm going to multiply that and then how much is that going to be? Right? Right? And then the next day on day three, I'm going to make another 10%. Right? So one, two, one plus, yeah, plus uh, the interest of 10% on, on 121 is how much? Right? Plus 12.1. So where am I reaching? So, oh my God, this is really hard. Right, so what's the, and then the fourth one is I'm going to take, I'm trying to do this on a mouse, it's with a trackpad, it's very hard. This is really hard. So I'm going to take, uh, hey, I'm going to take this number, right, I'm going to put it back over here and add another 10% to that, right, and then I'm going to get my final compound interest after four days at 10% per day. What, what's the final? Right, this, I'm, I haven't been able to confirm that yet. Just, just take a look, guys. Just give me one second. I'm just going to mute myself. Give me one second. I'm in the middle of the class right now. Just chill. We'll be done soon. Yeah. This is about investment in stock, by the way. So if you want to come and see, you can see. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So, guys, that's what we're doing, right? We're taking that 10. How much am I making per day? Now, what I made today is I have that in my pocket tomorrow to make more money on that. So it's very important here is if I have 100 today and then I have 110 tomorrow. One second, let me make this a little easier for you guys. Was this, is, this is super important to understand the beauty of compound interest. Because what you're doing is on compound interest, you are making money on, on the money that you already made. Right? So, yeah. So let me do this. So if I start with 100 and I say my rate is 10%, now, if I just do that over one year, right? So let's say 365 days. Or let's say just make it easy. Let's say 10 days, right? If I say every 10 days, I'm going to make 10%, right? Every 10 days, I'm making 10%. Then after 10 days, what I'll have is I'll have 100 times 100. Right? The one second. Here we go. And I get 110 after 10 days. Are you guys following along? But now if I compound that, if, if I compound, if I say I'm going to make 10% per day, right? So instead of saying I'm going to make 10% in 10 days, I'm going to make 10% per day. So if I look at day 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Now I start the first day at 110. So what's that going to give me an in interest? It's going to give me $10, right? So that total is going to equal to what I had in my pocket. So in my pocket versus interest, which I'm making on that, that's money that I'm making. Now the next day, right? The next day, how much I have in my pocket is equal to the total. So total here, right? So now I have 110. Now what happens here is that interest is now equal to 11. So I see now that now instead of having 110 and remember, remember after 10 days, I was making 10%. 
So my 100 became 110, but now per day I'm making 10% over the same 10 day period. So 121, right? So now if you see, if I just finish this whole table and after 10 days, how, like, let's take a guess, how big do you think this number is gonna be over here? This number here, how big do you think it's gonna be? How big can it be? Two hundred and sixty. Anybody else? Like, how big can that number get? Let's let's see. Let's see. So, I'm at one thirty three, one forty six, right? Two hundred and sixty. So, in ten days, because I'm making money on my money. Now you notice how much that interest component. First, I was making ten bucks. Now I'm making 24 bucks per on interest. So interest is like my profit, you can imagine. So the beauty of compound interest is that I started with 100. I was making $10 off my 100. But now as soon as I put that 11, that $101 inside, on that $1, I'm also making 10% interest. So the beauty of compound interest is that it compounds over time and you are making money on your money. That's what's really, really, really important about the whole financial game is, is compound interest. Okay. Any questions about that? Now I had to do all this by hand. Sandeep, do you have a question? Okay. Now we use the timeline to visualize cash flow, right? So future value is at value at a time in dollars. So that's, that's, that's over here. The future value I can say is 259. The present value is 100. So I have my future value is 259. My present value is 100, right? There's a formula. The future value is equal to the present value times one plus the rate of interest per period to the power of N, the number of periods. So this is just a quick way of you to calculate the same thing out. But you can imagine that doing this by hand every time is nearly impossible. So I'm going to say that my future value is something, my present value is something. Then I've got my interest rate per period, right, per period, and number of periods. So now why is that important? Because a period can be a day, a minute, a week, a year, 10 years, anything. So my future value, I don't know how much that is, that's X. <coughs> my present value is 100. <coughs> my interest rate per period is, say, 10%, and I have 10 days. So according to the form, I mean, there's also, there's many, many ways to calculate this easily. Oops, I made a mistake over here. Right, and we get uh, the same answer very, very, very quickly. So now I can use this math, right? And I can use this to understand, okay, if I had $100 in the bank today, what if my interest was 9%? What if my interest was 1%? So I can use this very, very clearly to figure out exactly what my interest periods are. And okay, now I'm saying that, let's say that it's 10%. Now, let's say when people talk about savings, right, they say, okay, how much money should I save? So let's say every month you save 5,000 rupees from your salary. Say you're making, say, 30, 40,000 rupees. You're saving 5,000 rupees. Okay, and every year you're able to generate 8% in interest. That's per year. Okay, and that doesn't sound like, let's make it 8% is like the S&P. That's the U.S. average in India. Let's, let's take U.S. average, right? So 8%. Now, Let's say you do this every year. No, sorry, this is every year. So let's make it every month. So 8% divided by 12. Oops. I'm used to Google Sheets and the thing is different. Okay. So that's per month. in months, right? That equals 8% per year. So now let's say, how old are you today, Sandeep? 23. And uh, let's say we want to see by, how, by the time you are 40, so 40 minus 23, right? In 17 years, if you save 5,000 rupees per month, right? How much? That's 204 months. Okay, I'm going to hit enter here and don't get scared. How much do you think this number is going to be? It's just 5,000 rupees per month. That's not that hard. 
for somebody who's working 5,000 rupees a month is nothing, right? And you're only 8% per year. You're all 23 today or whatever. And now in, by the time you're 40, 17 years, right? What I get over here is I'm going to make 19, this is not right. One second. Yeah, one minute per month, number of months, 8%. One second. No, one second, guys. I'm not used to Excel. Okay, you should probably be saving more money than that, Sandeep. You probably don't have to be sending 10,000 a month. But the thing is that this is not. One second. I'm trying to figure out what's wrong with this calculation over here. But then you guys can see that this is obviously not correct, right? If you're saving 5,000 per month. Okay. Who knows what the problem here is? Has anybody figured it out? So the issue here is that we're, what we're saying is that we're not saying that Sandeep is going to be making this much money per month. What we're saying is that the value of 5,000 rupees is going to be 200 and is in 204 months in 17 years is going to be worth this much 19,000. So for us to understand how much money Sandeep is going to make, we have to add this number on a monthly basis to itself, which we'll come to. I got excited and I wanted to show you guys how much you can save and make money. That's not the value of future value of money. The future value is just to say that if I have 5,000 rupees today, how much will that money be worth? How much is the purchasing power of that money in 17 years? So 5,000 years, 5,000 rupees today is worth 19,406 rupees in the future. And we'll come back to this exact example to show you that that value of money if he saves every month from now until he's 40, how much money he'll have in the bank. Okay. So the future value of 5,000 rupees is worth 19,000 X rupees after we save around 8% a year for 17 years. Okay, that's the value of the money in today's in today's rupees. Okay, so here are a few practice problems, guys. I'm not going to get too much into the math over here. It's very difficult when we're doing this over video call to do the math and to practice that. But I'll give you these questions anyways that you can practice on. So now the whole point of this, Sandeep, can you please mute yourself, dude? I keep hearing myself. Yeah. So why do we care about future value of money, present value of money, compound interest, all of that? Why do we care about that? That's because as an investor, you must be compensated for giving up your money. You're giving your money to somebody. And with that money, people can do things with it. And you have to think of interest as a compensation for you renting your money out. So compensation depends on risk. So if somebody's going to, if something, if there's a low chance that you're going to get your money back, then your interest will be much higher. If there's a high chance that you're going to get your money back, then your interest on your money, your rent is going to be lower. So if you give your money to the government, which we can assume it to be stable, you may not make as much money as if you gave your money to a startup. Right? So some of the main risks are counterparty risk. That means the person you're giving your money to, they may not be able to give you your money back. There's a reinvestment risk and there's a maturity or duration risk that after some amount of time, right? So let's do, so counterparty risk is that the person may not be able to pay you back. The reinvestment risk is that in the future, the rate may not be the same as today, right? So don't worry about this for now. It's a little complicated. That's more about bonds. And the maturity or duration risk is the longer you hold on to something, the riskier it gets. Okay, up till here, in terms of time value of money, uh, interest, about any of the risks, is any, any questions so far? No questions? Okay. Let's move on. Now, when we come to looking at a comp uh, sorry, go ahead, Jasip. Yeah, Jasip. No questions. Okay. So when we look at the when we look at any company or any sort of business, there are three financial statements that give us all of the information or most of the information we need to be able to judge that company. Okay, so there's three very important terms that you guys need to understand, which is the balance sheet, the income statement, and statement of cash flows. Okay, so the balance sheet is a snapshot in time. If I look at Jas's bank account right now, right, that's a balance of his life right now. 
it doesn't say how much money he had you know last year or three years from now or how much money he will have but right now in time i can see exactly what's happening to jarsh's bank account or to a company so balance sheet is a snapshot in time it reflects the company's assets liabilities and shareholder equity at that moment in time and it's listed in order of liquidity you don't have to worry too much about that but an asset is something that you hold on to where people owe you money or you can make money from it a liability is something that removes money from your company right and shareholder equity is the um, uh, equity of you know so basically if i own something in a in a particular company if somebody else owns part of my company they have equity in my company like we discussed last time at right? how you can buy into companies so shareholder equity is what the shareholders own assets and now why is shareholder equity on the right side right why is shareholder equity with the on the on the liability side that's mostly because shareholder equity is something that you have to pay out right shareholders gain um uh profit based on your company's profit through dividends or they can sell out their equity and request money from a third party or from the company itself if the company is doing a buyback so assets are equal to liabilities plus shareholder equity and the balance sheet will show you what the assets are what the liabilities are, and what the shareholder equity is okay so assets are broken down into two main categories it's a uh, current and long term right so current assets are assets you have right now and then long term assets assets are essentially items that the firm owns liabilities are the some anything the firm, firm owes so what you own is an asset what you owe is a liability and equity you know like we said we can go through this later but say it's basically uh, people who own uh, equity in your company okay this is an example of what a uh, balance sheet would look like for a particular company now why are we interested in this because when we look at investing in companies we want to understand where what are their assets how, what amount of asset do they have how many of those assets are current how many of those assets are long term right what is their liquid what is their liability structure right so in this what i can see is okay this company has around $12000 in cash they have around $13000 $12000 in short term investment uh they have uh, inventories worth $509 and this could be in millions of dollars as well right let's just take this as normal dollars uh they they have accounts receivable so that means people owe them around $2422 and we can look in okay they have deferred tax assets they have xyz they have properties and plants worth 25 to 2455 uh goodwill acquired intangible total other assets and total assets worth $39572 okay great now we know that assets equals liabilities plus shareholders equity so let's see what liabilities they have they owe $5520 in accounts payable that means these are accounts that they have to pay out and then their accrued expenses are $8572 those are their current liabilities that are going to be have to be paid out soon their non current liabilities they're not giving too much of a breakdown that is equal to $4450 which gives us $18542 here total and we see in shareholders equity what the shareholders own is $21000 so total i look at the balance sheet i look at the assets i look at the liabilities i look at the shareholder equity first of all as a, as a company owner these have to balance out okay but as an investor looking in you want to understand the ratio of assets to liabilities you want to understand you know do they have a lot more assets do they have a lot more liabilities what is the ratio of those liabilities how many of those liabilities have to be paid out soon so you may see a company that looks completely awesome on paper then you dig into the balance sheet you say hey man in 6 months these guys have to pay 5 million dollars to some sort of governing body that's not a very healthy investment for you to get into because after those 5 months are over and they pay that 5 million dollars that's going to negatively reflect in their balance sheet as cash out of the company right so now when you look at the income statement like the balance sheet was a snapshot in time the income statement is a measure of a company's performance over a particular period so i'm looking at this like jarsh's bank account from jan 1st till today what went in what came out right operating versus non operating sections exist what you need to understand is that there is a particular flow over here of how we calculate so revenue is what i sold right so a lot of you will hear this word revenue a lot so if i sell 10 apples and each apple cost 10 dollars right so that means i have revenues of 100 dollars now my cost of goods sold so to sell those 10 apples for 10 dollars how much do i have to pay so say i had to do some marketing i had to pick the apples i had to transport the apples to the buyer suppose per apple i had to spend $5 so $5 per apple selling at $10 right so that's $5 in terms of cost of goods sold per apple i sold 10 apples so let's say my revenue is 
My cost of goods sold is 50 because it's five per apple, 10 apples were sold, right? So 10 times one, 10, 10 times 10 is equal to 100. So 10 apples at 10 USD, right? So that's 100. And then minus my 50, which is my uh, cost of goods sold, gets me a gross margin of $50, right? That's at the product level. Now at my operating expenses. Now let's say that I had to rent a tractor for this entire delivery and that tractor cost, I have to rent it you know, per month. So for this particular month, I had to pay say $10 in operating expenses. So I come down and I'm at my operating income of $40. So you can see here that, okay, a company says that their revenue is 100. Okay, but our operating income, our EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes is 40. Now let's say I had zero uh, expenses apart from that and I had to pay income taxes, say, of 10 bucks to the government on this. So my net income of the company is 30. Now what's happening with Uber, WeWork, and all these other companies that are not making money, right? They have a lot of revenue. Revenue is awesome. Everybody's paying for cabs. But what's happening is that, suppose they do 100 in revenue, their operating expenses are 200, for example. So minus 200. So what happens is that their net income becomes minus 100. Even though they sold $100 worth of taxi, taxi rides, their operating expenses are much higher as a company. So yes, they are positive in terms of revenue, their revenue positive, but they are net income negative. And that's very important to understand. So this is, a, this is what uh, an, an income saving can look like. What are your net sales, or your net revenue? How much did it cost? What is the cost to sell this? What is your gross margin, right? Now, what are all your operating expenses? Research development, send general selling, administrative, my total operating expenses. Okay, what is my operating income? Here's my operating income. Okay, so I, I sold $32,000 worth of software, but my operating income was just 6,000 bucks. Right? Some other expenses came in, then my income before uh, interest and taxes, and that is what is gonna be the taxable income. Right? So many companies will remove their operating income. I mean, every company will remove their operating income and the taxes are just on that income after operational costs are removed. So I pay some taxes on it and I get a net, net income over here. So my net income here is 4834, even though I sold $32,000 worth of revenue. Now, now when I take this net income, I can take the number of shares that I have outstanding and I can divide that and I can say, okay, per share that an investor owns, I'm able to provide X number, so $5.48 in basic earnings per share. We'll get back to this, so, so don't worry about it. So here, this company is saying that they have 881,000 shares issued. So if I divide uh, 881,000 divided my, by my, my earnings number, I'll get $5.48 per share. And this is an easy way for you to compare across companies, right? Apple is giving you $10 per share. Uh, Intel is giving you $12 per share. It's not the only way, but it's an easy way for you to understand, okay, what is my EPS, my earnings per share? But more importantly, it's for the same company. Last year, what was the earnings per share? This year, what is the earnings per share? So last year, the earnings per share was $10. This year, the earnings per share was $15. That's awesome. But you have to understand, okay, why did that happen? Did the number of shares reduce or did the earnings increase? Lastly, we have the statement of cash flows, right? How much cash is coming in? How much cash is going out? The three basic components of cash flow is cash from operations, cash from investing, and cash from financing. All you have to understand is that the beginning cash plus your cash flow from oper operations plus cash flow from investing plus cash flow from financing equals end cash. So what, why is this important is that I, we want to see as investors what is the company doing with the cash that they have. Right? Are, they, are they spending cash on operations? Right? That means like their, uh, their employees, their office space. Are they putting their cash in investment? That may be in R&D. It may be in buying new products and equipment. It could be in buying another company. Or are they getting cash or spending cash on financing? Are they purchasing debt? Are they issuing debt? What are they doing with their money? So the three musketeers, right? Net income, cash from previous and ending cash balance. Those, this is kind of like the three statements working together. From your income statement, you get the net income. Your cash from previous balance sheet, that comes from the balance sheet. The ending cash balance comes from statement of cash flows. And this kind of gives us like a, a very quick snapshot of the entire company. So any public company, you can access the information. So what I want you guys to do is go to the Bombay Stock Exchange website, find a company that you like, 
uh, and please reach out to me on WhatsApp if you have any doubts on how to do this. Uh, and what you can do is uh, you can request for these particular statements and go through them yourself. See what Tata is up to. See what Reliance is up to. <coughs> now, this is the US specific thing, but basically what will happen is that uh, the same thing exists for India as well. Companies have to form a uh, file a uh, reports on a quarterly and annual basis, right? Um, and it's the same for Indian companies as well. So you can find out what these reports are and you can find these reports and you can also reach out to the company. If it's a public company and say, hey, I'm interested in investing in your company. I want to buy some stock. Uh, most companies will have an investor portal that you can click on uh, or you can reach out to their HR team and they'll, or their investing team and they will give you the access to the information because as a public company, they have to show the public all this data. And as a private company, you're showing this in, information to your private investors. Okay, that's a lot of information for today. Uh, so quick amount of quiz time, right? Uh, which equation below is correct? Take a look and let me know what you guys think. Any, any ideas? Anybody? Okay, remember that your beginning cash, how much cash you have in your pocket, plus your cash flow, and cash flow can be positive or negative from your operations, plus your cash flow from investing, plus your cash flow from financing is equal to your end cash. Okay, that's the correct answer here. What are assets? Yeah, assets are what the firm owns. What are liabilities? What the firm owes, right? And assets are equal to liability plus stockholder equity. All right, guys, so that's enough for uh, today. That's a lot of information. And uh, normally we did this over uh, over an hour and we spent some time on Q&A. So <coughs> we have about five, 10 minutes. So let me know, I'm gonna stop the screen share. Okay, so let me know what questions you guys have about any of this. Any questions so far? The only way to really do this, guys, is to really get into it with real companies and uh, experience it for yourself. Any questions that I can help answer at this point? Okay. No questions at all? Okay, so what I'll do quickly is just share with you um, here. So here we're gonna take, oh, an error has occurred while screen sharing, one second. Oh, it is not letting me share my screen for some reason. Interesting, it's showing me an error. So what I, all I did was I Googled Reliance balance sheet. Right, so you can, I'm gonna send the link. Yeah, I'm gonna send it in the chat. All of you can click on this link. Let me know when you get it. Or even better is I'm gonna send you the link for all their financial statements. So then you'll be able to, okay. Reliance. Yeah, investor relations, reliance, here you go. So guys, go through this with your newfound knowledge that you've just gained. And uh, you can take a look at this link that I've just shared. And through that link, you'll get access to their half yearly communication, their 10 yearly communication, um, you know, their annual report. Everything is online, very easy to search for. You can also download in PDF or you can download it with Excel as well uh, and then kind of tear through all of that. Um, and what's very important, one thing that we didn't mention is something called governance, right? And leading statements. So each report will have information from the company about, you know, that they want you to read before you go to the balance sheet because there's something that needs to be explained. 
right? Maybe they invested very heavily in a particular plant or they had some issue with the taxes or whatever. So there'll always be like these cover pages that you can read and go through. And it's super interesting to really tear through these. And now this is, once you go through this, now then we're going to be set up to understand, okay, how do we read through this information in the next class that we have? How do we digest this information? How do we compare companies using this type of information? Okay, so I've shared